What's up guys, it's your boy Iceberg Tech back here with another one. PCs, am I right guys? It's all pretty expensive stuff these days, and like you, I'm always finna save money without FOMO on performance. Do I want to pay extra for cores and threads that don't give me more FPS? Hells nah, bro! But do I want to lose AVX2 instructions and single thread performance just to save a few? That lot resource. No way guys, that's cap. Okay, maybe uh, I can't pull off relatable. Sorry, I don't talk like this. I'm 40. I, I don't even know why I'm wearing this ridiculous backwards cap. The Intel i5-4690K, however, is very relatable indeed. The 4-core, four 4-thread four i5 was the bedrock of budget gaming for years. Ever since the first core i5s, this family struck the perfect balance of single-thread performance, modest multitasking, overclocking potential, and, crucially, price. While games like GTA V made dual cores largely obsolete, and i7s were overkill except in rare instances, Four vanilla cores more than met the match of games in the late 2000s through to the second half of the 2010s. The i5-4690K embodied this back in 2014. Based on the Haswell architecture and featuring an unlocked multiplier, this refreshed model with improved thermal interface material was codenamed Devil's Canyon. A CPU like this would have appealed to those looking for serious overclocking headroom, but today I'm testing at my standardised clock speed of 4.5GHz. Despite coming up on a decade old, these chips can probably still reach higher clocks than this, but with more and more modern games recommending more than four threads, it's possible that even higher frequencies won't be enough to save the 4690K. To find out, I have an ASUS Z97 Gryphon motherboard with 16GB of DDR3-2400, a Zalman tower cooler and an RTX 3070, as well as a battery of modern games to test it in. I've said before that Valorant likes itself some clocks and doesn't care much for cores. Well, you can also add AVX2 instructions to this shooter's dietary requirements, as the 4690K eclipses the venerable 2500K by a massive 35%, a disproportionately large bump compared to Haswell's estimated 15% IPC increase over Sandy Bridge. It's also about 10-15% to faster than the 500MHz lower clocked i7-7700, which I'd call a pretty excellent result for an i5 that can be had for less than half the price of that locked i7. And if you needed further proof of the benefits of Haswell in modern games, Battlefield 5 is it. Not only does the 4690K beat the 2500K by 25% on average and over 80% better lows, it beats the hyper-threaded i7-2600 and 3820 in the same metrics and matches some CPUs with higher core counts. Of course, being a highly multi-threaded game, Battlefield still runs significantly better on Haswell Extremes, but this is a suitably impressive result for a game that doesn't suffer weak CPUs lightly. The quad-core 4690K puts up a remarkable showing in Fortnite performance mode. It's 232 FPS average, running about 20% better than the older 2500K at the same clocks, and even slightly beating the lower clocked yet multi-threaded i7-7700. In fact, there's not much difference from some of the six cores of this generation, which makes it very hard to predict exactly what Fortnite actually wants from a CPU. And now, the curious case of the flight simulator in the daytime. If you just look at the comparison chart, this is a nonsensical result. 58 FPS leads the charts, beating both of the Haswell E high-end desktop chips handily. This seems too good to be true, and it is. Look carefully enough at the buildings and you'll see that the game is dropping to low LOD models way closer than you'd expect, despite being at the same settings as the other CPUs. Some iconic buildings look completely unrecognisable until you're a few blocks away. It's not quite the N64 experience I saw from the 4th gen Pentium, but it is noticeable. If you just want a smooth flight sim experience and can forgive a drop in scenic detail, this is 
probably fine, but don't fool yourself into thinking this is a better result than an i7-5960X. Moving into the AAA action game section, reality begins to catch up with the 4690K. Four cores and threads, even good ones, can't maintain a smooth experience in Spider-Man Remastered, as although the averages break past 60 FPS, 1% lows drop below 30. And that's just the conventional rasterized rendering mode. With RT enabled, it's kind of like someone cut Spidey's strings with averages of just 38 and lows barely into double digits. The Haswell chip does beat out the lower spec sandy bridges, but loses to just about everything else. Alas, there are no surprises for guessing how well the 4690K does in Cyberpunk either. With RT disabled, averages only reach 40 FPS, with 1% lows just above 20. This is about half the performance of the i7-5960X. And you might call that a win, given that the Extreme Edition had four times the thread count and cost four times the money. Still, it's a poor showing from a playability standpoint, and naturally this only gets worse with ray tracing enabled. RT on, with DLSS turned up to balanced as per usual, drops averages to 32 and 1% to 18.5. Naturally, given how those other games fared, Red Dead 2 was never going to be a good result for the 4690K either. The GPU is nowhere near fully utilised at these settings, I could turn off DLSS and get the same results. The poor old quad-core can't quite pull off the magic 50fps average, and lows dip close to the 30 mark. On a positive note, I know I said I'd drop Elden Ring, and I will, but I'd already recorded this gameplay, and besides, this is a good argument in favour of the i5-4690K in modern usage. Elden Ring isn't easy on older or low-spec CPUs, so a 54fps average is a pretty encouraging result. Lows aren't great, and it's possible that more intense areas and more difficult encounters might punish you for that, but if you have this CPU in your system and you want to give this game a go, it's certainly possible. The Witcher 3 performs quite closely to Cyberpunk on the 4690K, which I guess is appropriate. The first run was, as usual, as stuttery as all hell, but the second pass didn't improve a whole lot either. Averages at 1080 Ultra with DLSS balanced were around 43 FPS. 1% lows fell below 20 FPS and 0.1s to only 10. Considering how the G3258 did, I think we can definitely call this a win for Socket 1150. But as you'll see next week, there's still room for improvement. A 7.51 second turn time in Civ 6 may seem to the average person like a pretty good number, being less than a second slower than the far newer and far more expensive CPUs at the top of the chart, but these seconds add up, or so I'm told. So I guess this isn't the most surprising conclusion to a 2023 review of a flat quad-core, but here we are. I was actually very pleasantly surprised by how adept the i5-4690K was at esports and other competitive shooters, which is of course just typical of a 9-year-old. However, if you're looking to drive some more premium cinematic open-world gaming experiences in the 2020s, 4 threads just isn't enough anymore. That doesn't necessarily mean the end of the road for Socket 1150. Next week I'll be looking at one of the best CPUs made for the Socket, and if you can't wait that long, I already posted this video in which I featured it as an upgrade from the i5 in a decade old budget build. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.